it's great to be at the end of a fantastic set of uh, set of talks, which gives us the opportunity to follow on on what everybody else has already said. So we already know why we're here, um, which is great. So I can just jump into stuff like saying a reminder of who we are, which again, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave that hanging up there while I kind of represent where I'm going with this talk. I'm, I'm part of that is just, you know, we're here to kind of represent customers there and trying the improvements we're trying to make. And what I put into the abstract was a quick romp around what happened in the last four years, the last time this conference was here, um, and the last time the Abcam was present at it, and just kind of go through those processes of what we've done. And part of that I wanted to highlight is that, you know, we, we're very focused on recombinant, and we'll continue to be focusing on recombinant. You'll see that theme coming through through this talk, where we are currently putting in around 2,000 in-house RAB maps from a fantastic team in China, um, ongoing every year. And we've been doing it for a while, and we're going to continue doing it this way by improving our quality standards. Um, and thank you again to Cytab for last year putting us in as being the number one antibody supplier of the year. It's been a tussle with CST for a while, but you know, <laughs> we got there. So yeah, brilliant, brilliant that you are. We are, it's, it's a fantastic competition that we do against each other and, 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 and the rest of the people here that, that care about antibody validation. And I think Alejandra gave the game away. She took away my, my great number, which is bigger than that. So we, we focused a while ago on our CITES, removing those from the catalog um, and trying to transform and not just in, not just for validation purposes, but this is really about animal health. Um, and we took out or replaced 10,000 antibodies or so. But actually what Alejandro referred to yesterday is through this last 10 year period, we've taken out about 60,000 antibodies, replaced them, transitioned them, uh, made new recombinants against them because not necessarily, coming to Peter's point, it's, it's not necessarily that they're bad. They're just not creating, they're not the standard that we want to set ourselves for as we work our way through. So we've kind of been going through that transition period um, which is quite a large number. And you can see again in the numbers here around uh, specificity models and things that I'll talk about in a more in a minute. And what was really nice that, that came from, from Andy earlier is, is that we can see a change in that polyclonal, monoclonal uh, diversity, the way that the, 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 the community is moving into more monoclonals and, and fewer use of polyclonals. Again, it's not that polyclonals are always bad, but we want to go in this recombinant monoclonal route more and more. And, you know, we've been actively decreasing the number of polyclones we use, replacing them. You know, going back to that other slide, or we transition our way into a, into a recombinant portfolio as we go through. And what I wanted to focus on really for the rest of this talk is about how we're going around doing that and what we've added in into that process. So this is our workflow. Okay, so it's not like anybody else's, it's the same as everybody else's workflow, but we were using a design control methodology to implement that. So we have a, a design of what we want to make. And let's say, for example, that was IHC and flow cytometry. Uh, we would use that in order to create our immunogens. We would utilize, so we, we have the technology to understand that our immunogens are very important. We'll come to that in a second. And then we utilize again our, our application screening, which is sitting in around here which is therefore based around what we've designed against and then we're trying to create antibodies that way. To go into a final QC methodology um, and adding into that as many of those applications that we really want to try and target to, you know, if we want to add into immunocytochemistry or IP and chip, we will do that until you get to a final launch, design or release and launch. And what I want to talk about are these boxes in here, which is, you know, about our, our commitment into our in-house immunogens a commitment into knockout cell lines, where those fit. Mass spec, uh, IP mass spec at tail end, I'll talk a little bit about that. Some enhanced validation and, and ending on biophysical QC. So getting it right at the beginning is really important. Getting those immunogens right. And what we were finding was that we, were, we weren't happy with the quality of the immunogens that we were getting in. So we created internal teams in order to do this. So we've got a team in Waltham, we've got a team in Cambridge, we've got a team in Hangzhou, producing high quality, uh, high quality proteins in for that, uh, for that immunogen process. Now you'll see, as we mentioned, uh, along the way, everybody's mentioned alpha fold. We also use alpha fold as part of that process. Again, trying to design those immunogens and then putting them through a variety of different 
um, different expression processes, trying to get the one that works best, best solubility, and then adding in, you know, various biophysical QC processes, not necessarily all of them all the time, but, you know, to try and get the quality that we want, because we accept that, you know, the quality you put in for that um, immunization is really, really important. If we get that right, we can start to you know, nail the rest of the end part of it, the validation part. So we've been, we invested very heavily into that and we also produce high quality proteins out into, into the market as well. And we've been doing, as I said, we, um, uh, knockout validation for a while. This is the part of that knockout validation slide, a couple of slides on this. So this is where we've been doing it for so long in that end stage. We know we've got antibodies that are present and then we use knockouts to try and uh, determine whether they are fit for purpose or not. Okay, so we've got 4,500 antibodies confirmed at this point. And we've been generating cell lines, and those cell lines are, are available. A 1,000 of them are proteomic validated. There's 5,000 that you can do on a make-to-order basis. But, and, and again, thanks to CITAB for, for recognizing that in, in the past and the awesome work of Icaros that we love working with um, and will continue to do so. So... We're committed to doing this, but what we're trying now to feed this through is into earlier stage. So I will come out and say, yes, knockout models are my number one of those criteria. Right. So, you know, we utilize them and we don't utilize them in isolation. Everything we said yesterday, it's not an isolation model. We will want to use these in the screening cascade when we're generating an antibody, give us confidence that what we're really picking up is truly the target of interest, but then we'll add in all the rest of that application test on top with all the positive negative cell lines that people have mentioned um, with the with the all the all the uh, tissue based screening, etc. What we've done and what we're generating now is a high throughput cell line engineering process that is going to aim to produce a hundred cell lines a month in a fully automated process. You can see in here we're using Cell IGO liquid handlers all in a, in a massive big fume hood, uh, not fume hood, uh, culture hood, just to generate this in, 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 in scale. And part of that reason for that is because you see the graph at the bottom, you know, the, the quality they were getting from our, our vendors was good, but it wasn't high enough and it wasn't where we wanted to be. So we, we put it in ourselves. And I, it then feeds into this application test. How am I doing? I'm doing all right. So it feeds into that application testing, and, and we do this a lot. And I put this slide up quite a few times, mainly because I am always frustrated myself in the fact that you only see this much of the data that we've got, and we've got a ton of data that's in the background, which if you have a need, you can give us a shout. But there's, you know, there's a whole TMA's worth of data around that application screening process, particularly in IHC, where we'll do three different TMA's for everything that has ever gone through. Uh, the process through our, our Hangzhou colleagues. And we're trying to enhance that on certain applications, on certain particular uh, targets where we want to kind of shortcut a process that we would have, I would have done when I was working in the pharma industry, shortcut some of that, put it into larger scale tissue microarrays, doing image analysis, adding in knockouts if they weren't already done, adding in in-situ hybridization if we need to, all these pieces that enhance that validation stream and give confidence to that particular target and maybe shortcut some of that pharma, pharma aspects that go through. And so, and we do this on a, on a, mostly on a bond. We've got five bonds in Hangzhou. We've got two in Cambridge. We've got one in Waltham. You know, so we've got a, a variety uh, of antibodies, about two and a half thousand nearly uh, going through that bond RX and, and um, through Ventana now as we try and bring ourselves into where other people are working. So, and I'll come to the end. So I'll jump to that end point. So we've been playing around with IPM aspect. Um, and this one is it, it's one of my favorites. I also partly run a, a, a team, and, and some of my colleagues are here, who look at the, the horrible end when the customer comes back. And this is my plea to everybody. I put this slide up as a reminder to anybody in the audience. And I think I'll speak for it, all the vendors. If you know... If you bought your antibody in and it doesn't work, by all means, go and buy another one. But please tell us which one it was so that we can go and fix it. We all want to fix it. So just keep, you know, pester the scientific support teams, send the data over because this is what's going to come through. And this is a, a, a work that we did 
um, particularly at CD9, it's an important marker. Um, and what we're finding is that actually technically it works. If you get the right Western blot with the right size gel, you'll get, a, it, it's a knockout. It's no problem, it is actually a knockout. The problem is that it's got a really big band just above it, which if you don't quite run it right, looks exactly the same. And it's predominant. And so we were, we had had a number of complaints through this and we, they, we started an investigation program um, it was a fairly high selling antibody and we were quite concerned about it. So again, it's not that it doesn't work, it's just not hitting our quality criteria. So we went that extra year, nine yards for the IP mass spec, pushed it through because what we wanted to do was not just determine that there is an alternative and that alternative is genuinely CD9, but to go back to those customers. And in this case, we went back through five years worth of uh, customer orders to contact those customers. We went back through all the publications of those five years. Those are the people that actually don't just have it in the fridge, but actually used it. Contacted them individually and to say, look, you, we've got an antibody you've been using, which technically works, but if you haven't been getting your exosomal preparations right, if you haven't been quite running it, there's a danger that you've in, overinterpreted the data. But not just that, actually go in and say, well, we know what this target is. We know what it lies, it may be important. It may actually be interesting to you. Let's freely reveal this stuff to you and, and work with you to see what we can do. And, and by and large, I think 100% of the customers came back and said, thank you. So, you know, we're using IP mass spec in that end stage process. I know thermal, congratulations, well done. You do it in your validation steps. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a potential future for us, but we are kind of putting it as a, as a complaint testing process. But as I said, the future for us is a common. This is where our direction. This is where we're going to go. And the reason for that is because it allows us to do so many more things. So, for example, you know, this was, uh, again, Saitab features heavily in this talk. Thank you. It's a brilliant. It's brilliant that you allow us to come in and talk. Um, the, these are common multiclonals. We can do this. We can bring in what we hope are polyclonal replacements. We can bring them together by mixing a, a host of other recombinant monoclonals to different epitopes into the same place. And we go, we get that sensitivity of a polyclonal. And we also get the same applications coming back to why they use polyclonals. I mean, if you, you want to use it for uh, an ICC and a flow and, a, and, and an IHC, well, you can do that because you mix the IC, what CC one with the flow one and the IC one and they all work. And so you get that kind of a, a, a advantage of what a polyclonal does for you. And so we now have a, a number of these sitting on the, uh, sitting on the, on the website and, and you can see from the data the, the quality of it. But the second thing I wanted to highlight here was, was the Chimera portfolio. So we've only got 140 or so, but because they're recombinant, that's what we can do. We can start adding in Chimeras, we can flip backbones, this happens to be GFP, um, and uh, allows us to be able to kind of ping that through. And so the last thing I wanted to end on was biophysical QC. I mentioned it at the beginning. So again, because we know what we've got, we know we have the plasmid. We know exactly what the size is. We're using this as an identity. So we're adding biophysical QC into our development portfolio. So it comes in here, right? You do application screening, you do a biophysical QC check, you make sure it's exactly what you say it is. It's got one heavy chain, it's got one light chain. And when we put it through final QC for that last antibody. And we've been doing that for a little while. And what we switched on now is we switched it on into our, what we call our replenishment workflow. These antibodies are coming through for replenishment all the time. Right, so. We switch this on and right now we are, it's probably gone up since the last two weeks I took this data. Um, we are now 68% of the way through our catalog. At 7,680 to be precise, RAB maps have been pushed through. These are the RUO catalog RAB maps. Um, rabbit monoclonal antibodies have gone through. HPLC is following as a bit of a faster fall. They've all had application testing at the end of the day. So we know they all work through this process. They've all, but you know, we're gr gradually working our way through biophysically testing all of these through uh, HPL HPLC, LCMS, um, and aggregation through dynamic light scattering. And thank you to UCB, wherever you are, for mentioning some of this stuff yesterday. I, I can't thank you enough because that means I don't have to go through all of it. Um, and equally, on, in the normal MPD RAB MAB space, we've gone through about you know, nearly 1,800 of those 
of these antibodies, profiling them and keeping them in stock in that way. And what you can see, I did want this to kind of come up as a surprise. I thought aggregation was going to be a problem. I can, you, you just, in your mind, I've been working with antibodies for a while, you think they aggregate. We do not find aggregation as an issue. We actually find a 0.8% you know, failure rate, 99.2% pass rate, and we've got really rigid criteria on aggregation for DRS. Similarly, our pass rate in HPLC is, is very high. Um, but the one that actually tends to cause the most issue, because what we're really looking for, we've got very strict criteria of what our heavy chain should look like, because we know what it, we know what it should be, we know what the mass should be, and what the mass actually is, as we get changes in that discrepancies between the actual mass and the, and the predicted mass. And so, again, UCB mentioned things like lysine clipping. I'm definitely not an expert on this, but, you know, things like lysine clipping, glycans can make a right mess of everything. Um, frame shifts, we've had a really odd, example of a stop code on going past a stop code and we get these things that might need a little bit of tweaking of, uh, of the sequence in order to be able to, to to be happy with it and you know one of the things that I wanted to highlight in the three minutes my two minutes I've got left there you go um, we do occasionally see an extra light chain now that might become a little worrying but actually we repair it. It works in application QC. It's always worked in application QC and it'll continue to work in application QC. It's not that. It's we, what we're having is these odd passing mutations, things that we don't know. They pop up. They're probably completely non-functional, but they're there. So we, re, we fix that uh, and rederive it to, to make it accurate and correct. But I bring this up because this is one of our clones that we were working on, Cyclone D1. It was, it's a great clone. Um, it worked beautifully as an early passage hybridoma, but over passage time, it would quietly go off and we'd have to keep on rederiving it and keep subcloning it and keep low passage going. And realistically, I think what's going on is that you know, another mutation has gone through and the cell's growing out because it's a faster grower and that's what happens with hybridomas over time. Now, we made that recombinant. We recombinant convert virtually all of our antibodies where we can. You know, we put it through bifosco QC. We know it's that's an extra peak of a sodium adduct. But we, we know it works well. We don't have this problem anymore. It's reproducible in, in every case. And I don't have to go back and go back to previous passages. So, you know, it happens all the time. It's happening now. It's happening in your labs. It's happening in every antibody. But the only reason we know this exists is because we look for it. And because we look for it, we're then going through to try and, and, and re-derive those where we find an issue. And so I, I want to just end on two slides, which I think I've got. One is referring back to my MJFF. Um, and again, we've been working with it for many years. The purpose of going through all this work is you get these really great collaborations and gain trust from great folk like the MJFF, producing antibodies that are, are great for that market and for those researchers to be able to progress their research further forward. Um, we've had a, a number of, of, of good targets that have come through for us. Um, and for them and for that research market that we're very happy with. And similarly, it just only came out yesterday, it's all over LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to embarrass Lander Hander because I can get her back for yesterday. That, you know, we, we launched again a 500, well, Lander String launched a 500 plex panel, um, high plex panel, which is all Abcam antibodies. Again, that's because we've got a wide range of recombinant monoclonals that are sitting there that can be pulled um, from our catalogue and working very, very closely with them as partners. So I hope what you can do, this is basically my end slide, that you can see that you know, we've been working really hard in this intervening period, bringing in new pieces that add in a lot of confidence and quality into our workflows to allow us to be able to get more and more in that recombinant space. And my last plea is again to everybody that this is not just us. Um, this is a, a massive community of our Abcam researchers, the amazing team in Hangzhou, we are outstanding, and Jim Lee's sitting over there, um, and, as well as a community of researchers feeding this information back, telling us where we get it right, and telling us where we get it wrong. So if you please spread the word. And equally, this community of, 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 of vendors that care about what we're trying to do. And we can have a competition with CST and Thermal um, and everybody else, and, but it, it helps drive us all further forward faster. Thank you.